Mike Rosenberg is a longtime member of Templa Muna and a past president, a leader, a stalwart of our morning minion, without whom Torah reading and minion uh, would not happen. Mike has been delivering this Shabbos Shuvah Drasha as a great gift to rabbis, and I can't think of anything better to give us. We don't want anything, just this, just this. But feel free to take other sermons as well. He's now been doing it long enough, as he wrote, to start recycling them, and that, we won't say, has been done before. Shh. He has retired from Maimonides a couple of years ago, a year ago after 36 years, double high, working there, and he's been tutoring B'nai Mitzvah candidates now since 1989. I can't do the math, I'm too tired, but it's a while. He is now working as a reporter for the Bedford Citizen and chairing the town's tricentennial committee. Woo. He's also a trustee of the Lowell, Festi Fe Lowell Festival Foundation. I have no idea what this means. And a corporator. At first, I thought it was some kind of thing in construction for the Emerson Hospital. You'll explain that. Mike and his wife, Dawn, have been married for 54 years and love to connect to their children. The title of his talk is Nowhere to Go But Up. Let's hope. Thanks, 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 Ruth. <laughs> this is an account by Arnold Lustiger, one of the Talmudim, uh, paraphrasing part of a sermon by Rav Soloveitchik. A Jewish doctor and atheist was an inmate in a labor camp in Latvia. Among the prisoners was a group of yeshiva students with their teacher. Returning to the barracks each night, they would sit together on the ground and recite Psalm 130. The doctor later wrote that he would have given his life to have faith like that under such circumstances. Psalm 130 is a declaration that a Kodesh Baruch Hu will forgive our sins leading to the ultimate redemption. Here at Temple in Munam, we've gotten to know Psalm 130 intimately over the past 12 months. Immediately after the catastrophe of October 7th, Rabbi Lerner instituted daily practice of inserting these eight verses into every morning and evening service because this is one of a small number of psalms that our tradition says we recite when Jews are in distress. So we are chanting the psalm in Hebrew in the traditional call and response format. And we follow Psalm 130 with the Achenu, a plea for God's help to free our fellow Jews being held captive in English and sometimes in Hebrew. Even under so-called normal conditions, the Achenu culminates a series of brief prayers that follow the weekday Torah reading because indeed, there are always Jews who need deliverance from darkness to light, from subjugation to redemption. In Hebrew, psalms are called tehillim, songs of praise. That doesn't necessarily describe the entire anthology. But over the centuries, our tradition has identified specific psalms that are appropriate to say during times of illness, barrenness, famine, and war. From a literary standpoint, a psalm to the modern ear can be defined by a theme, but isn't often a cohesive narrative. A single verse is often more memorable and meaningful than the psalm in its entirety. Um, and you get the idea. Psalm 130 is only eight verses, but it has a clear theme. And it resonates particularly this week, this day. Indeed, historically, the psalm opened the Yom Kippur evening service before Kol Nidre was adopted around the 14th century. Thematically, Psalm 130 is so appropriate that many congregations, including this one, recite it during the daily minyan, um, during the Asarit you made Shuvah, the 10 days of repentance at the beginning of Shachri. The verses, which can be broken into couplets for analysis, follows a pattern that some people experience on Yom Kippur. At the start of this holy day, an individual feels mired 
in his or her sins and begs God to listen. And the prayer service over the day inspires and encourages the worshiper. God will certainly forgive me. And as we conclude in the Elah, there's a sense that indeed our prayers have been heard on high and we can renew ourselves. That's all fine. But what does this have to do with the, divine, the plea for divine assistance to the Jewish nations surrounded by enemies in battles that some say is basically an extension of the War of Independence? It's clearly not a petitionary prayer that many congregations insert after the Shabbat Torah reading that asks God's blessings on the IDF and indeed on the welfare of the state of Israel itself, tefillah l'shalom hamdinah. So to me, there's something troubling about the message in this context, linking divine forgiveness to the welfare of the Jewish nation. Does that mean that it's, it's our fault? I keep going back to that concept that remains in our Musaf Amidah. This is the Musaf for Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. It means because of, our, because of our sins, we were exiled from our land and driven far from our country. Really. Take a quick tour through the eight verses. If you want to follow along, it's on page 450 in the, in the Lev Shalem in the, in the Shabbat Sidur. If you don't want to follow along, um, I, I, trust me, I think I'm going to get it right. Um, First of all, Shir Hamalo begins Shir Hamalo. Just understand that that's a label. That's a song of ascents applies to uh, 15 consecutive psalms. There are various explanations for this label, some historical, some spiritual, but these words shouldn't factor in an interpretation. Um, but this word does. The next word, Mima Amakim, from the depths. This might be the most significant word in the entire experience. It's in terms of relating it to where we are today in world events. Mimat Makim, from the depth, from the depths I called to you, Hashem. Drowning, despair. That alone secures the relevance of Psalm 130. Hostages are imprisoned in underground tunnels. Psychological depths, the fear, the grief, the bereavement that is besieged state of Israel, and indeed the Jewish people for a year now. Most of us in the diaspora have experienced individual, personal depths, sometimes repeatedly. So the metaphor suggests that unless God intervenes quickly, the worshiper will drown. Here's a commentary from a 16th century Portuguese scholar, Yosef ben Yahia, on how primal this is. If persecution should confuse my thoughts to the point that I cannot compose a coherent prayer to God and I cannot concentrate on my words, nevertheless, I pray that you, God, will hear the sound of my plaintive cry and agitated voice as if it were an eloquent prayer. Note that verse 1 is in the first person, past tense, karatikha, I have called. We've been here before. And the urgency... And the desperation continue into the second verse. Adonai spelled out, which is the personalized plea to God. Hear my voice, let your ears be attentive to my plea. So the individual beseeching from the depths. The Talmud says that whoever... I'm not directing this at anybody in particular, okay? The Talmud says that whoever raises his voice in prayer is a person of meager faith, resembling the false prophets who cried out to awaken their deaf idols. But later commentators say that this particular plea in Psalm 130 is simply anguish. Now there's a shift into verses 3 and 4. Im avonot tishmor yach. Adonai, again personalized, Adonai, mi ya amod, if you keep account of our sins, who could stand? Who could stand, it's a, the answer to that question in verse 4. So I found a 
piece by a rabbi affiliated with the Shiva Har Etzion, south of Jerusalem, Rabbi Elchanan Samet. I want to quote his, this from his essay on Psalm 130. What this stanza teaches us is that the depths from where this person called to God are a metaphor for sins. The worshiper is almost losing the possibility of existing because of them and makes a desperate cry to God who can save him through forgiveness. And by shifting to the second person, now we're speaking in terms of all of humanity as a general truth. I want to note that there are several words. You know, it's funny that everybody talks about how in the north there are so many words for snow. In our tradition, there are several words for sin. <laughs> and they're not synonymous. Get that? Synonymous sin. I got that from Alex Edelman when he was in the seventh grade at Maimonides. He's done, done better since then. <laughs> I will know our intentional sins, something deliberate, much worse than just tossing recyclables in the trash. But if these, I will know, these sins are the cause of why we are in the depths, then we belong there. Our predicament is self-inflicted. So then verse 4, Ki imcha haslicha leman tevorei. It's the answer. With you there is forgiveness that you may be held in awe. It's an escape route. It's held in awe because God never lost faith in us and our capacity for change. There are times when we'd rather just be left alone, but God's forgiveness makes demands on, on us and who we are. Now we're going back to verse 5 in the first person. I will wait for God, and my soul waits. In his word I put my hope. Actually, that kiviti also is translated as hope. Um, there are many translations that, uh, different connotations between the two Hebrew words for hope. But another translation I found, an, uh, an authentic one, uses the word as confidence. Because when we repent, we know we're going to be forgiven. Especially in a community. That's why Yom Kippur is considered a holiday that's one of joy. That's why when we sing the Oshamnu, it's in a major key. Like, yeah, this is, this is really going to work. And then it follows up, the couplet follows up on verse 6. My soul waits for Hashem more than the watchmen wait for the morning. Watchmen wait for the morning. So the Shomrim, the watchmen, know that the sun is going to come up. This is a natural phenomenon. It's going to rise and my shift will be over. And it's, this isn't just somebody punching a clock. This was a dangerous job back in the day to be a night watchman. Our worshiper would like to believe that God's appearance is as assured as the sun coming up at the end of their ship. Some commentators read this verse as a metaphor for the dawn of redemption. I am even more eager to see the dawn of redemption because the midnight of exile is so long. Why is this uh, verse repeated? Why are these words repeated? Shomrim Laboker. Some say it's for emphasis. Rashi says the repetition of the phrase symbolizes that no matter how many times we've been disappointed, we have to keep believing that our situation will improve. That's helpful to me. Now verse 7. Now we're going into the third person. Yachel Yisrael el Hashem ki im Hashem hachesed becharbei imo fedut. Israel, put your hope in the Lord. For with Hashem there is loving kindness, and great is his power to redeem. The key word here is chesed. Chesed is a hard word to translate. Leif Shalem calls it kindly love, but I, I don't think that's strong enough. I, sometimes it's better to leave it untranslated. There are elements in our tradition that say we must repent by suffering, but God is the ultimate Baal chesed and, and can mitigate that. In the Mishnah Arachim, it says that even minor discomforts or inconveniences can be considered as suffering 
which God ordains. Stuff that happens every day, like putting, putting an item of clothing on inside out. Specifies that. Or not, not putting your arm in your sleeve right the first time. You know, or, or, or reaching in your pocket for a quarter and you pull out a nickel. Those are, those are examples of God's chesed. That's the suffering. Finally, and he will redeem Israel from all its sins. That solidifies with certainty that God's positive response is going to happen. What does forgiveness actually signify? Cheshbon hanefesh, introspection, a sincere commitment to improve. It's on us to change, even to reinvent ourselves. All admirable goals, but again, how does this relate to Israel's profound challenges? Is it a quid pro quo? Israeli Jews need our help, so we pray for forgiveness? Does this require an exercise in mass repentance, such as we will hear about in Yom Kippur, after uh, Jonah prophesied in Nineveh? I think it's futile to try to look for cause and effect here. I think Psalm 130 is a total that's more than the sum of its parts. It isn't about what it means, but simply that it is. These verses in totality symbolize our concern, our anguish, our hope on the welfare of Israel and of the Jewish and Kalal Yisrael with a textual foundation in our religious tradition. There are other examples. The song Am Yisrael Chai, which Shlomo Karlbach wrote decades ago as a declaration of faith in God, like the Israeli flag because it, it resembles a talit like Hatikva, which to this day moves me to tears. Um, it's the context. It's not the words. It's the solidarity that Hatikva evokes. By the way, there's only 12 anthems in the whole world that are in a minor key. Afterwards, we'll talk what the 11 other 11 are. <laughs> so the daily recitation of Psalm 130 links us to congregations all over the world, and that's the power of this tradition. It forces us to direct our thoughts to all of our fellow Jews, whether in captivity, on the front lines, in the depopulated parts of the country, besieged on some North American campuses, just walking down city streets, wherever those literal or figurative depths are. So I hope this exploration of Psalm 130 will make that segment of our worship more meaningful during these days of repentance and beyond, and inspire us to learn more about the meaning of and ideas behind our tefillot. Mach hat immer